What I have to tell you today, this evening, is something, uh, a whole lot of things. It's going to, maybe you might think about this instead of being a talk, maybe it's more like a, 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 a movie that's animated. <laughs> I hope it's animated anyway. Um, <clears throat> um, we, um, I've been working in this area for, um, I think, 30 or 35 years, something like that. Um, we've done a lot of pioneering research looking at things that the EPA does not look at. And um, so I'm going to talk about not only uh, pesticide producing or pesticide resistance GMO crops, but I want to talk about the fundamental biology behind this. I want to give you a conceptual background before we get into looking at data, but really my focus is going to be to show you data in the context of, of a narrative uh, so that um, we get a better idea of, of what the heck is really going on biologically and how are we being impacted by pesticides in ways that are typically not even uh, being uh, advertised. Um, the first thing I want to point out is that we are, because of our long lifespan, what I will refer to as slow pollinators. Everybody knows what's been going on with butterflies and the pollinators, but uh, and how they're being impacted, but we are biological systems and we have very similar responses and hormones to the kinds of animals that are, have much have shorter lifespans. And one of the questions we're asking these days are, are we also feeling, facing a colony collapse disorder? Um, <clears throat> I want to ask you a question just for kicks here. What do magicians, pickpockets, and the current administration and PGMOs have in common? And the answer to that is distraction. So you can't see what's really going on. And that's really kind of the fundamental premise and the foundation for a lot of what you will see. Another question, why did saccharin cause cancer? And the answer is it didn't. It was the traces of solvent used in its manufacture that did. And so little things mean a lot. And that's really going to be one of the th major themes of the, tonight's talk is tiny, tiny concentrations down on the parts per trillion. A part per trillion is like taking a single drop from an eyedropper and dropping it into a p 20 mm, pools, 20 Olympic-sized pools that are all put together. One drop in that huge amount of water, that's about what a part per trillion is. But it's the region where our bodies function, where our hormones function. And it's turning out in our research and that of a lot of other people that uh, that kind of concentration, which the EPA never looks at, uh, can have massive kinds of impacts on the biological systems in our world. Today I want to really, I only have time to talk about the tip of the iceberg. Uh, things aren't always what they seem. It's like old Charlie who was driving the LA freeways uh, just this last fall and he was driving along and his cell phone goes off and he pushes a button to answer and it's his wife and she says, Charlie, Charlie, be careful. There's some idiot on the freeway and he's driving the wrong way and I don't want you to get hurt. And he says, what do you mean one? He says, there's hundreds of them. <laughs> So it depends on your perspective. <clears throat> now I'm going to talk about four things tonight. Uh, everything is interconnected, and we're going to dive down into multiple levels of biological complexity here. I want to talk to you a little bit about basic principles and new definitions, how common pesticide mixtures can modify reproduction, sex behavior, learning, immune function, and induce chronic diseases. And then finally, most importantly, some safe, effective, and inexpensive solutions to these problems. Example number one in the data, <clears throat> the endocrine system. What we have here is a map of what's been happening with sperm counts. You can see there's been a decline from about 1940 when they first started measuring human sperm counts. That's been a decline of about two to two and a half percent per year. There's a whole set of green uh, or yellow spots there, which was the first study by Elizabeth Carlson and Neil Skakabach in Denmark, where they noticed that the Danish uh, sperm count was way down. Uh, let's see, I don't know if I have a... A uh, cursor? No, I don't have. I'm going to have to walk over here and just holler. <clears throat> Did you see 
yellow clusters here were the original study in 1992 from the British Medical Journal. Elizabeth Carlson, Neil Skakabak, and their colleagues. And they did all of these studies. They went back into the literature because the Danish male sperm count they were looking at was way down here. Uh, also, they noticed that sperm count in Danish farmers who were doing organic was way up here, about a mid hundred, uh, a <clears throat> hundred million sperm per milliliter, um, uh, as compared to here. And so they're wondering, how in the heck is there any evidence in the literature that this is more than just a Danish phenomenon? And when they went to the literature, these yellow spots and the size of the yellow spots indicated how much was in the literature about sperm counts. Once they published this first work, everybody said, nonsense, that's crazy, that's, we don't believe that. And so Auger and his colleagues in Paris, because Parisians are so spread with their sperm counts, they keep track of the sperm counts in the males, you know, and in 1975, their sperm counts were about 90 million sperm per milliliter. By 1995, 20 years later, they were down here at about 60 million sperm per milliliter, and there's a continuous line down here. So their rate of decline was actually faster than the global average. Then <clears throat> Abel and his colleagues in, in, uh, uh, <coughs> in Denmark uh, found out also, yeah, they were really the ones that got these two pieces, that information went earlier to Carlson, but they finally published it here. And then Patrick and his colleagues from Helsinki said, okay, well maybe we're losing sperm counts, but how about how many percentage of them are normal? And so on this graph here, in 1980, the percent of normal sperm was about 50%. Ten years later, by 1990, the sperm that were normal had dropped to 25%. So this was sperm that had no tails or sperm that had two heads and all kinds of other anomalies. So it was not only a decline in quantity, but also of quality. And uh, <clears throat> finally, Nabi and his colleagues in 2017 said, let's revisit this whole question and see what's happening. <coughs> And their analyses showed that the average sperm count globally is now way down here. So this trend line is continuing, and if it does continue this way by 19 or 2035, which is 15 years from now, we can expect the population of the planet where we have more deaths than births. It may happen sooner than that. If we get down to 3 million sperm per milliliter, we will have zero natural fertility, and that's not too far off the scale, like about 2050. So <clears throat> there's a lot of concern about what is it that's driving this phenomenon. And <clears throat> there are several things I want to point out. When in uh, 1940, about 60 to 70 percent of the U.S. males qualified as sperm donors, but by about 1950, we were down to 6 to 7 percent of the U.S. males qualify as sperm donors. In 2012, when the Israelis looked at their soldiers, who were the main sperm donors in Israel, they were down to only 1% of the soldiers who would now qualify. And by the way, 2013 was the first year ever that for U.S. whites that we had more deaths than births, but that was covered up by immigration. By the 26th of April in 2017, one in eight couples in this country has fertility problems. And here's something that very few people are aware of, and that is that all of us are conceived as bisexual organisms. We are first th third of our developmental process. We have both a male and a female reproductive tract. And then at about a third of the way through our development, the embryo starts looking at the ratio of testosterone to estrogen. If it's a genetic male, typically the testosterone will be higher than the estrogen, and that will cause the induction of, in the embryo of Sertoli cell uh, primordia. They will be the, the nurse cells for sperm production when they reach sexual maturity. 
or if est estrogen tends to be higher, then <clears throat> that embryo will toss the male reproductive tract and go on to induce the brain structures and the reproductive structures in the female reproductive tract that it retains. And that's what it will grow up to develop. So it's this ratio of testosterone to estrogen at a critical decision point in our embryonic development that decides how our sexual preferences are set and, and how our uh, uh, or our, our reproductive tract is induced to be able to function in a normal way. Now, one of the things that not too many people know about is that the two most common herbicides, Roundup and Atrazine, each can alter the balance of testosterone to estrogen, and it's been shown in every major group of vertebrates that this can alter not only the sexual development in terms of the gonads and the reproductive organs, but it also can modify the brain structure and the behavior that's associated with those different brain structures. <clears throat> We'll talk more about that in a short while. The second example I want to show you is what's happening to the neurological systems in terms of US autism birth rates as of 2014. You see way down on the left in 1975, way over on the left, only one in 5,000 births was autistic. And by 2014, that curve has risen to a frequency in 2014 of one in <clears throat> 60, uh, <clears throat> eight births. A year later, the measurement estimate was one in 45 US births was autistic. This is an enormous, enormous change and it has n very little to do with changes or uh, improvements in diagnostic technology. These are real numbers, real changes that are happening <coughs> in children. Example three, immune system, chronic inflammation. On the left you see a series of lines that are going from high to low levels with increasing time from 1950 to 2000, you see a decrease in, in diseases that can be dealt with by means of vaccinations and, and other kinds of analogous measures to reduce the frequency of these things. But on the right graph, you'll see what's happening with chronic diseases. The number of <clears throat> immune disorders, the frequency of them from, again, from 1950 to, the, to about year 2000. Type 1 diabetes is going up, asthma is going up, multiple sclerosis is doing, going up, Crohn's disease is coming up. <clears throat> in fact, there are about 10 major chronic diseases that are growing in very rapid fashion. And a lot of people want to know what is driving this should point out that the current administration defunded the highly successful WHO program for early containment of highly infectious diseases like Ebola, just as they did the US Pandemic Response Unit when they cut it out two years ago. I want to point out to you that chronic inflammation is the basis for at least 10 chronic diseases. I'll, we'll got to talk about that later in the talk, but I want to get that out in front of you so you keep that in the back of your mind. Inflammation is a major, major health issue. I also want to point out that about 30% of the U.S. population, it's estimated now, are taking daily medications that have immunosuppressive properties. And we are right in the beginnings of what we call an epidemic of, of not a flu virus, but something a little bit more aggressive. Now I want to give you an idea uh, and a perspective on how everything is in interconnected in a biological way, in a very fundamental way. And this is really kind of the central theory behind all of the kinds of impacts, the, sorry, that we are seeing. Um, <clears throat> on the left, you'll see a series of downward pointing or upward pointing pyramids. On the lower left corner, this is a paper we published in 1999. 
where we um, did a, actually a 10-year study looking at aldicarb, atrazine, and nitrate, which are common in groundwater. And we wanted to know um, if we look at those mixtures in, at environmental concentrations, are they going to impact uh, central nervous system, immune, and endocrine systems? But be, and what we found was that we got changes in aggression, in immune function, and thyroid hormone levels. In other words, neurological, endocrine, and immune functions. When you had supper tonight, or if you haven't had it yet, when you have it later, you're going to take in mass and energy and nutrients, which will fuel your molecular cellular systems. These molecular cellular systems are the basis for the organ systems that we have, such as the central nervous, the immune, and the endocrine systems. These three systems talk to each other all the time. They use about 60 different molecules to communicate. And together, the molecular and the organ systems support at the individual level reproduction, growth, and behavior. And at the population level, that supports birth rates, death rates, and social structure. And at the community level, we get immigration, immigration and the relative species abundance. All of this resting on these cellular molecular and organ system functions. <clears throat> when we get a sick organism which is being impacted by pesticides, which means insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, we begin to undermine and subvert the very functions, the very foundations upon which this entire superstructure rests. And that is a really serious problem. <clears throat> I'm going to talk and show you in this talk about inverse dose responses. Um, <clears throat> when, when we have inverse dose responses, what that means is as you go to lower doses, you get greater effects. And I'll show you data that show that we have inverse dose responses in all three of those systems, the nervous, endocrine, and immune systems. The reasons for that are complex. I could, uh, there's a paper that's written in 2012 that really explains this beautifully, but basically our own enzymes function in ways that are not intuitively immediately obvious and are ignored by the EPA when they're doing their testing or having their testing done. I um, also want to point out that the gut is a really important organ in terms of immune function and neurological function and also endocrine function. We'll talk more about that too. I also finally want to point out that gene expression is really important. It controls that lower left-hand triangle, the molecular cellular systems. It sends out the information and the coding for them. And what's been uncovered recently is that that gene expression can be hacked by environmental contaminants. And when that happens, you lose that coordination, you lose, you change the way those things are functioning at the molecular level. And we'll talk more about that too. So this is the idea that, that you've got these, all this superstructure that's depending upon proper function at these basic fundamental levels. And of course, everything that we have and we eat and we consume as, as humans and all the other life on the planet depends on beneficial soil microorganisms that are making sure that those nutrients are available to plants. But the, tri the trouble with an herbicide like uh, Roundup is that it's designed to stop the amino acid synthesis, the aromatic amino acid synthesis, which means that it can, is capable and very effective at killing the beneficial soil microorganisms upon which this whole superstructure rests. And so by taking that out, and, uh, the, it was believed that uh, and all, the only effect was going to be on plants maybe, we don't have to worry about the amino acid synthesis, but we do have to worry about the microorganisms that are in our gut. And they respond to Roundup the same way the beneficial soil microorganisms do. And that's a real problem because it means impacts on immune function that we had not anticipated. So <clears throat> before I get into that in more detail, I want to explain now some basic principles about why pesticides of any kind can get into the body 
And what is it that's added to these pesticides that makes them far more efficient than they would if they were just looking at the active ingredient, which is the only thing that EPA looks at or worries about? There are two things that are added to mixtures that you buy off the shelf. One of them is a non-ionic or a fat-soluble solvents that they put on. These things have no electrostatic charges. They're, they're neutral electrically, so to speak. And then there are things called surfactants. We'll talk about <clears throat> this, this figure. Um, and uh, let's see, I'm going to take over again. I want to show what, I, what, I, what this figure is all about. This is an, a, a projection of a drawing through a cross section of a leaf. This is the top of the leaf, here's the bottom of the leaf. Here's one of the stomates that the uh, plant uses to take in gas and release oxygen. There's a hemisphere of water here which has surface tension. And if you put a surfactant in here, that will weaken that surface tension and make it easy for a pesticide to get inside the cell and begin to do its work. On the top, You've got a really waxy surface, and if you want to get through that waxy surface, what you do is you put in a lipid solvent. That gets it right through the skin of the, of the leaf or an insect, and that's how it's designed to work and get these active ingredients in there. These two agents typically also have their own biological effects, and that's never considered. The whole thing about all of this, and the reason that I talk about it, is that our skin is a waxy surface. And if you haven't noticed, next time you get into the shower, see how the water beads up on your skin like a nice freshly waxed car. And alternatively, another way to think about this is when you go outside and you get rained on, why don't you dissolve? So it's a barrier. But if you have fat-soluble materials, it can go right through your skin, and so it can get into your body and bypass the natural defenses of the body, which are primarily in your liver and in your kidneys. <clears throat> the other way it could get in is through your lungs. And your lungs have, their breathing surfaces have these thin hemispherical films of water which have surface tension. And so the surfactants on here facilitate entry into your lungs, again, which bypasses your natural body defenses. So there are two ways these things can get into your body. You lie down on grass which has pesticide on it, and it can go right through your skin. Very important point to remember is these inerts that are part of the pesticide mixture that you buy off the shelf are not part of the EPA registration process. All the testing is done with only the active ingredient. And so functionally, what you have is a bait and switch registration process. They test the active ingredient, but they sell you the mix. And the two are very different in terms of their chemical activity. Also want to point out that it's been discovered, rediscovered recently actually, this was known actually 20 years ago from federal depositions, that these pesticide mixtures now uh, frequently are, uh, often have various kinds of heavy metals in them, so like arsenic, cadmium, cobalt, chromium, nickel, lead, in the off-the-shelf pesticide mixtures. Um, this of course has lots of implications, um, <clears throat> like the problem in Flint, Michigan, in their water supply. This is analogous to that. And so you get lots more than you bargain for when you buy a mixture off the shelf. And it's not just the active ingredient that the pesticide companies have registered. Now, once we understand how it gets into the body, now I want to tell you and explain to you how it is that it can kill or have all these unintended functions that can be way across the board. Firstly, how do you design a pesticide? Typically what's done is to create some kind of ring-shaped structure. This is carbon, nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen. And that ring-shaped structure there tends to have very little electrostatic charges on it. And that gives it fat solubility. Then they will hang off of a 
uh, of a ring-shaped structure like this, some kind of a charged group. This happens to be nitrogen and two hydrogens, but it could be, I'll show you some others, alternative things that give it a charge group. And what that does is make it water-soluble. So you have a molecule that's both fat and water-soluble, and the reason for that is that, firstly, you want to get it inside the cell. And how do you get it inside each cell of the body? Well, if you've got fat solubility here and no electrostatic charges, you can get it to dissolve in this cell membrane, which is a phospholipid membrane. Once it gets inside the cell, and there are different ways we can do this, I'll show you that in a minute, then that electrostatic charge on here gets to another fundamental biophysical principles. The first one is fats dissolve in fats. That's what gets you through the membrane. And the second one is opposite charges attract. So now, this particular example, this is hypothetical here, which has a positive charge, will be attracted to any opposite charge, like the mitochondria, which is full of negative, electric, uh, ele negative charges. And this is the powerhouse of the cell. Also, that your DNA, your genetic material, has a net negative charge. So these things come together, or they come together this way. And because you've got all kinds of ions in your cell, this thing could be going anywhere. And so what we have here is a very reactive molecule that can be doing all kinds of things. Depends on where it enters a cell and the timing and everything. And finally, these other ingredients can also disrupt and break cell membranes, and that's one another way that the molecule can, the pesticide can get inside the cell. So what we have here, in effect, is a molecular bull in a china shop. It's capable of doing all kinds of different things that are unpredictable, and it, and and can happen purely by chance. All right, that's a very crude beginning to trying to understand how do pesticides get into our body and then how do they do their dirty work. Now, I want to talk a little bit about GMO crops and what these mean to our, the, the biochemistry of, of humans and of animals. This is, a, of course, a corn field. Um, this corn, if it's genetically engineered, will probably have Bacillus thuringiensis thuringiensis toxins, that is BT toxins, which are there for larval control. Uh, they may very well be spraying atrazine for weed control. That bacillus thuringiensis, that bacterium that's produced, or that uh, prototoxin that's produced in the corn cells is converted by the gut of an insect that eats the corn uh, uh, and converts it to an endotoxin, which is a poison, which induces pore formation. It punches holes in the walls of the gut. And that means that it causes those gut cells to rupture. You begin to create a hole, or a set of holes in the gut. And in the case of uh, caterpillars that have been eating this stuff, it causes them to die very, very quickly. Now the question is, might this happen in a mammal? And here's a paper published by Judy Carmon and her colleagues out of uh, Adelaide in Australia. Long-term toxicology study on pigs fed a combined genetically modified soy and GM uh, diet on the left versus a control pig that did not get GMO food. You can see the difference in the inflammation, a huge inflammation on the left. And what that means is strong immune activity, leaky connections between the cells opportunities for bacteria and other substances to escape the gut and enter the bloodstream. And now we can say, well, man, here's a GM-fed pig. I'm eating foods that have GM in it. Is there any chance I might be getting a leaky gut on all of this? In 2013, a paper came out in PLOS. The title was, Complete Genes May Pass from Food to Human Blood. <clears throat> in this abstract, which is down here that I'm sure you can't read, but I'm going to read a little bit of it. Here, based on the analysis of over 1,000 human samples from four independent studies, we report evidence that meal-derived DNA fragments, which are large enough to carry complete genes, can avoid degradation and, through an unknown mechanism, enter the human circulation system. In one of the blood samples, the relative concentration of plant DNA is higher than the human DNA. So 
if our guts are very frequently being plundered and poked through by various kinds of chemicals and disrupted, and lots of things are leading in, leaking into our bloodstream, foreign molecules entering our bloodstream stimulate our immune responses. That means chronic, long-term, low-level inflammation. I'd like to show you some of the known things that Roundup, which means glyphosate, surfactants, and non-ionic solvents can do, and what their implications are. It can induce DNA damage, which alters gene expression, which <clears throat> alters developmental patterns in embryos. It can change aromatase. It can inhibit it. And <clears throat> aromatase is a key enzyme because what it does is convert testosterone to estrogen in a one-way trip. You only go from testosterone to estrogen. I'll show you that a little bit more later. What that does is it can change the fetal brain development and the gonad development, which means it can change sexual orientation and preferences. I'll show you data on that, too. It stimulates the retinoic acid pathway. Too much vitamin A. When you do that, you get more birth defects, like microcephaly, which is tiny heads. And that's been shown in humans. It alters energy metabolism, like mitochondria. These are the powerhouses of the cell that I was referring to. What happens is you start breaking up the mitochondria and you introduce oxidative stress. That oxidative stress kills nerves, alters hormone levels, alters immune function, and is the basis for more than 10 chronic diseases. It shuts down the shikimate pathway. I mentioned this earlier. A loss of aromatic amino acids, bacteria die. You lose beneficial bacteria in your gut. And those beneficial bacteria account for about 70% of your immune function from the gut. Roundup is used as a pre-harvest desiccant. Most people don't realize this. It's, and, and it's also, of course, used as a weed killer. But it's put on sugar cane and beet sugar and grains. All these things that are white that are in our diet. And that means since it's put on just before harvest that you can be basically modifying the, con the chemical composition of the foods that make up our sweeteners and our grains. They have, uh, there's a recent study out in uh, 2018 showing that there's Roundup in Quaker and General Mills cereals. And we can show you that publication too. Roundup was originally patented to chelate divalent metal ions to clean out boilers. What we mean by chelation is that calcium, magnesium, zinc, copper, <clears throat> all of these things can be tied up by glyphosate, which has a couple of charged groups that are negative, and it picks up all these divalent metal cations. Why is that important? Because, for example, calcium and magnesium are critical for the catalytic reaction leading to DNA cleavage, that is, the splitting of DNA when it copies itself. Divalent ions, that is, two electrostatic positive charges in general, are involved in biological catalytic enzyme reactions, which means that you're messing with the fundamental enzymatic control of the body chemistry. You can check this out on Google. Just search for PAN glyphosate monograph in 2016, or look for Mortisani et al. in 2003 or Mesnage et al. in Environmental Health in 2015, or just now Tang et al. in Environmental Pollution 2020, uh, are documenting all of these kinds of things that I just showed you. Evidence is hiding in plain sight. And all you got to do is just go to Google Scholar and check it out. Another paper that came out in Nature Communications not very long ago was a paper which has a, uh, on the left there an amazing title, <laughs> which is translated, How Good Bacteria Control Your Genes. Chemical signals from gut bacteria influence gene regulation in the gut lining and possibly in the brain and other organs. We'll talk some more about that. And I'm not going to explain this. <clears throat> 
I want to show, I want to talk a little bit now about endocrine effects that can reduce mating success. How common herbicides can alter sex hormones at environmentally relevant concentrations. We start with cholesterol way in the upper left here. Go through a series of reactions until we get to testosterone. And then there's a critical reaction here between testosterone that converts it to estrogen, and that's controlled by this enzyme aromatase that I talked about a little bit before. Roundup can shut it down, reduce its concentration, which tends to block that synthesis, so you start building up extra testosterone. If you happen to be a, a woman, a, ma a female, especially in utero, that may lead to masculinization, possibly the induction of polycystic ovary syndrome, not, which means no ovulation, and, and about 10% of US women have this right now. Atrazine, on the other hand, increases the amount of aromatase, which makes this thing go faster from left to right. So you can feminize uh, organisms by increasing that rate of conversion, because this is one way. It doesn't go both ways. It only goes one way. Estrogen feminization in males will lower sperm production. It can give you ovaries and testes in the male. You can get mammary tissue in male breasts. And of course, as we, I pointed out, you might see changes in sexual orientation, and I'll show you data on that too. And a couple of, in the lower left hand, here are some data or, or papers, Richard et al. in 2005 and Fan et al. in 2007, that document those changes, the effect of those herbicides on sex hormones. So we get these in soybeans, we get them in GMO corn. <clears throat> and now we can ask, what are the relevant concentrations of estrogen in humans? Is there evidence for reproductive impairment? This is a fun basic biology text picture. When I <clears throat> lecture in zoology 101, I use this a lot. What I want to know is what are the normal hormone concentrations of, of estrogen and progesterone? At the beginning of the menstrual cycle, this is, this is the menstrual cycle from the start to end uh, for about, about 28 days here. And these are various parts of the body. This is up here in the brain where the hypothalamus is producing luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Here's the ovary and the growing follicle here. And as it grows, it produces more and more estradiol, or what we think of as often or referred to as estrogen. We start off, at, if a woman starts off at about 40 parts per trillion. <coughs> and as this follicle grows and produces more hormone here, we have an inhibition of the brain as long as this is fairly low concentration. But once it reaches a level of about 400 parts per trillion, that signals the follicle to open to release the egg. And what happens with this high concentration is the brain completely reverses the way that it's functioning, and instead of being inhibited, we get this huge surge of LH and FSH, especially LH, which causes this thing to be released. Once it's out of here, this thing begins to change the amount of hormone it's producing. This concentration drops back down. You get inhibition again in the brain. But look at the difference in these tiny amounts of change of concentration causing a complete reversal of the way the brain looks at that hormone and how it responds to it. These are concentrations in the parts per trillion that can trigger all kinds of uh, reactions in the body. And <clears throat> Fred Valmasol at the University of Missouri, Columbia has shown that tiny concentrations in the parts per trillion can alter uh, the, the sexual and aggressive nature of rats that are lined up in a uterus next to each other. And if a male is next to two males, he will always be the dominant alpha male of the litter. If instead he's surrounded by two females, he will always be the most submissive male of the litter. And all of that because just a few parts per trillion of estrogen from the surrounding fetuses or testosterone from the surrounding male fetuses cause his you know, a very substantial change in his aggression levels and the way he's going to perform and function as he grows up. 
Tyrone Hayes at Berkeley has been looking at atrazine as, as it feminizes male frogs at environmentally relevant concentrations. And here we have a plot of the fertility of controlled male frogs. And here's what happens when you give them an environmentally relevant concentration of atrazine. And here again, I want to reiterate a very, very important principle. The terrestrial vertebrates, including humans, are conceived as bisexual organisms. We have both a male and a female reproductive tract. That's the first third of our development. They normally dispose of one of them during development based on the ratio of testosterone and estrogen at decision time, which is about a third of the way through development. If there are pseudo or xenoestrogens, which means basically fake estrogens, it looks like to a male embryo that it is more female, and so it changes direction, induces fewer Sertoli cells, that is sperm nurse cells, in the testis, and alters the brain's sex center of development accordingly. Tyrone tried to breed these frogs, and here is a couple of male frogs trying to breed with each other. Each of these animals has two to three to four sets of ovaries and testes in the body. Tim Pasteur, the <clears throat> representative for Syngenta that makes atrazine says, at this time EPA believes that no additional testing is warranted to address this issue. And I ought to point out to you that atrazine, again, upregulates or increases the amount of aromatase, which elevates estrogen, which elevates breast cancer risk. And by the way, Syngenta also makes drugs that treat breast cancer. Well, the obvious question now is, might estrogen changes alter human sexual behavior? Now you should realize that the estrogen receptor is what we might refer to as promiscuous. That is, it has about 12 different partners, like flame retardants, plasticizers like nonalphenol, PCBs, dioxins, phthalates, the things that make um, shrink wrap plastic, the kind of things that you might put over a salad bowl to keep the water from being lost by evaporation. Well, Bruce McEwen, a wonderfully brilliant epidemiologist and reproductive biologist at, uh, in, down in uh, the uh, Research Triangle Park area. In 1987, in Environmental Health Perspectives, volume 74, pages 177 to 184, wrote this paper, Steroid Hormones and Brain Development, Some Guidelines for Understanding Actions of Pseudo-Hormones and Other Toxic Agents. And in that paper, there's a paragraph titled Psychosexual Differentiation and Diethylstilbestrol, DES. Further insight into, into actions of estrogens on brain development has come from studies of offspring of mothers, human mothers, exposed to the pseudoestrogen diethylstilbestrol during pregnancy. It was originally given because they wanted to try to suppress the possibility of, of losing the fetus of abortion, natural abortions. So they were giving this thing prophylactically. In studies thus far completed and published, prenatal DES alters general measures of personality and leads to altered patterns of sexual behavior in adolescence and adulthood that reduce the formation of heterosexual relationships. These differences from carefully matched normal subjects could not be explained by sexual dysfunctions such as vaginismus and dyspareunia, which were low in both groups but rather appear to be due to psychosocial and neuroendocrine factors related to DES exposure in utero. These are the papers that he cites. Changes in sexual behavior. Well, we began to wonder whether or not <clears throat> herbicides, if they were doing this kind of thing, might be able to induce abortions and resorptions of embryos. And so we went to the local farm and fleet and bought some, a, a particular uh, herbicide mix that was used very frequently. 2,4-D it had in it, Mecoprop, 
in dicamba. All right, that's an herbicide. What do you notice about the structure of these molecules? A ring-shaped structure, fat solubility, negative chloride, negative acid, negative chloride, water solubility. Same thing here, same thing here. And by the way, 2,4-D, by the way, always has two small dioxins. These are some of the most potent estrogens on the planet. They have a very long lifetime. We absorb them, we put them into our fat, which may be in the ovaries, which have yolk in the eggs, which is fat soluble. And by the way, we have 2,4-D resistant uh, alfalfa now, which is being grown in Montana and fed to beef cattle. <clears throat> and so the question was, are we going to see changes in the number of offspring if we give these at environmentally relevant doses? So what we did was looked at litter size. We, we dose them, here are the controls, no, no chemical at all. This is nice, pure water here. Smallest litter size was eight. Very low dose here, 39 parts per billion, 320 parts per billion, 77,000 parts per billion, and 400,000 parts per billion. EPA said this was a totally safe dose. Now if we look to see what's the average litter size for, the, for all of these different doses. Which one of these is the smallest average litter size of all those doses? Which dose does it? The lowest dose at the greatest losses. An inverse dose response. The lower you go, the greater the effect. Well, before that, we had done another study. We discovered by accident that aldicarb was immunosuppressive a thousand times lower than EPA said was totally safe. There's a long story behind that. But basically what we have here, this was the study that we did. Uh, John Olson was the senior author on that paper. <clears throat> We're looking at the ability to make antibodies against a foreign protein. And here's the control, and we were getting on the average about 10 plaque-forming cells per spleen. This is a normal control. EPA said 1,000 parts per billion was totally safe. We went to that one, 100, 10, and 1. Again, an inverse dose response. Fewer proteins being able to be formed as anti antibodies, making antibodies against this thing. We couldn't believe that work. We repeated it four separate times. We had some of the best statisticians in the world come in who were on the campus there to help us analyze this to make sure this was absolutely correct. This was the paper that got us excommunicated from the EPA. Once they saw this, they said, don't bother coming back for funding. We're not going to fund you anymore. Inverse dose response for immune function. I want to point out to you that immune insult is associated with many serious chronic health problems. Asthma and allergic diseases, autoimmunity, infectious diseases and ineffective vaccine responses, cancer, neurodegenerative disease and neurocognitive loss, cerebral palsy, atherosclerosis, hypertension, male sterility. This is the paper right here, Dieter, Dieter 2007. Especially I want to highlight this one particular item here, ineffective vaccine responses with immune insult. That looks pretty bad, especially in the context of what's happening globally right now in terms of a possible pandemic. And th almost 30% of the U.S. population on drugs that have immunosuppressive properties. That does not look good. Neurological effects, learning and behavior disorders. 
This paper was a critical opening salvo. Elizabeth Gillette was a medical anthropologist working in the US and the people of Mexico and the Yaqui Valley in Sonora, Mexico contacted her and said, something is happening to our children. What was going on was that a wealthy foundation in the US said, let's help the economy of Mexico. We'll make some money available for agricultural development. The Yaqui Valley in Sonora, Mexico was purchased and they moved in there and they said to the local indigenous natives of Inca descent, we're going to make you wealthy. We're going to grow lots of crops here. You'll sell a lot of uh, uh, food to the US. And by the way, we're going to spray about once a week. Half of that indigenous population said, no, thank you. And they moved lock, stock, and barrel up the mountain to continue their organic agriculture. The other half of this population of related people stayed there in the valley and began to work the fields. And the women started to develop breast cancer and began to die in substantial numbers. But the reason they called Dr. Gillette in and her Mexican colleagues, who were also doctors, was that the children were different. Somehow or other, the children in the valley were not functioning like they used to. They could not skip rope and keep doing it. They could not drop clothespins in bottles. And when they asked them to draw a human figure, here's what the children in the valley who were exposed drew. Here's the kids from the foothills. These are five and four and five and six year olds. <clears throat> What you would expect is facial features on the hand, on the uh, on the f face, thing, digits on the hands and feet, and especially notice their orientation. These kids start at the top and they work down. When this child, I talked to Dr. Gillette about this. Are these normal? I mean, aren't these extreme? And she said, No, these are typical of the drawings that we got from all the kids. When we asked this person, this child. Where's, where's the top? She pointed here. Where's the bottom? She pointed here. I have a sister who is an occupational therapist in the Chicago area, and when she saw these, because she works with disabled kids, she tears came to her eyes. She said, I've never seen such de devastation neurologically. These children will likely never be able to develop normal social relationships, and they're very, very touch aversive. The Valley Teen Boys have now reached sexual maturity, and they have very large breasts. It appears that they may have mammary tissue in their tender breasts. The Teen Valley Girls have only fat in their breasts, so they would never be able to uh, nurse their children. The children's mothers in the Valley have very high rates of breast cancer. And so the question is, what will our children's future be? And a hint here is how much are we spending now on remedial education? In Madison, Wisconsin, we spend more on remedial education than on reading, writing, and arithmetic. The gut microbiome talks to the nerves, may impact on the nerves of the brain. And here's how that may work. Roundup and other toxic chemicals in Roundup kill the beneficial bacteria that degrade glyphosate. However, there's an increased harmful clostridia bacteria that in the gut that, and as that is determined also because of urine that contains glyphosate, so you know it's there. But the thing about this is that that bacteria that survives glyphosate is clostridia botulinum, which is immune to glyphosate, and that's what makes botulism toxin. Botulism toxin, you may have heard about Botox. Well, one of the consequences of that is when it leaks out of the gut, it, you start generating increased toxic phenols, which increase the inhibition of dopamine beta hydroxylase, which is a new neurological neurotransmitter. That increased dopamine gets into the cell um, material and breaks down into toxic metabolites. Those toxic metabolites increase the damage to the brain mitochondria, the powerhouse of the nerve cells that make them function. 
That means increased denaturization of the long parts of the nerves that make the connections with other nerves. And it shuts down the energy production, and, and so you have a major decrease in the energy ability and the transmission ability of neurons. So th <clears throat> that upper right-hand paragraph there from Scher in 2017 says, elevated urinary glyphosate and clostridium metabolites with altered dopamine metabolism in triplets with autistic spectrum disorder or suspected seizure disorder, a case study. In other words, they had in the one family, all three kids were impacted this way. This is purely correlation. It's not mechanistic. But somebody put together this data showing the usage in the red line of corn and soy with glyphosate in it and um, the number of children with autism. That's pure correlation. You, you can't say anything about that other than there's a, that association. But down here, a, another paper uh, in medical sciences in 2018 by a girl, Cardozo and Zaydan Chulia shows that all of these evidences together support the dysbiosis of the gut microbiota in general and the proliferation of intestinal clostridia may contribute to the clinical picture of ASD, likely functioning as key elements in the development of autism. Now, if we start changing the DNA, and the developmental processes, we can expect to see changes in development. We talked about feminization of males. One of the f kinds of feminization in males you can get is what we call hypospadias. I don't know if you know what a hypospadia is, but it's the opening of the penis, is, which is normally at the tip, but in a hypospadia, it's part way down the main shaft. So it might be at, uh, halfway down, or it might even be at the base of the penis. And so you have to have an operation to move that hole back up to the tip where it belongs. Paul Winchester, who is a clinical professor at the Indiana University School of Medicine and head of, and director of neonatology there, got wondering about atrazine, which was changing in concentration in the surface waters that were being used for drinking water and began to wonder whether or not the presence of atrazine might have something to do with these hypospadias, which were sexual dysfunctions, since atrazine changes uh, aromatase, which changes the amount of testosterone to estrogen. And what he found was when he looked at the frequency of male genitalia, in terms of month of conception, those that were conceived in the months when the atrazine was high had much higher rates of those hypospadias, those feminization kinds of effects. And here's something that's been happening in Wisconsin and other rural areas of, of uh, the country. This is called gastroschisis. The intestines, part of the uh, internal organs are outside the body of the, of the uh, baby girl here. And I want to ask you, what does this picture suggest? And that is that the genetic control of development has been changed. That is not a normal developmental process. Changes in fetal gene expression have been measured in rats. Uh, it's turning out that if you look at control versus um, uh, vinclozolin, we get genes that control Alzheimer's, carcinomial, synovial carcinomas, schizophrenia, mutant allele specific amplification, neural tube defects, and various tumors. The big thing about this is that the particular kinds of changes that have happened here have turned out to be multi-generational, heritable changes that can go as much as four generations down the developmental pathway so that an exposure by great grandma can decrease birth defects and induce these kinds of gene-related diseases. 
We can also increase death rates by compromising neurological, endocrine, immune, and epigenetic functions. And I'll just show you very briefly how the technologies that are emerging now can be used to get at the fundamental biochemistry and how the fundamental biochemistry of the body is changing. This lady here, Dr. Fariba Sadi Porter, she's developed metabolome dynamics platforms so th with 30 microliters of cell culture or tissue samples or biofluids of whole organisms. She can get unbiased detection of biomarkers that change in response to perturbations like stress, infection, disease, toxicants, hibernation, substrate utilization, and gut microbiome functions. She can also, using her stable isotope-assisted labeling, look at biochemical pathway shifts and flux measurements in real time, non-invasively using breath in response to perturbations like all of these things here. And I just want to illustrate for you how that happens and how you, how you can measure it. On the upper left-hand group there are some very narrow tubes that are about maybe uh, 15 about about uh, six, six or seven inches long. There's 30 microliters of serum. She takes them up here, puts them into a nuclear magnetic resonance machine, and by nuking them, she can get a sequence of what is the biochemistry doing, in this case, for the onset of infection. Now here's a mouse, and, and each one of these spikes here is a different molecule. At zero hours, here is it healthy. It's pretty quiet. Four hours after the administration of a foreign protein, now we're starting to see some acetate and, and a few other things start to pop up. Eight hours into the infection, all kinds of things are popping up. And so you can follow the fundamental biochemical processes of, a, of an infectious process <clears throat> going from but it turns out to be very simple kinds of things to um, far more complex molecules and numbers of them and abundances of them that weren't at all present when the animal was healthy. This kind of change also appears in chemicals, exposures, it turns out. And here is one example of work that's in review showing a whole suite of different biomarkers, like the ones I just showed you, for when you introduce atrazine at 10 parts per billion, these are different biomarkers, one that, that is shut down, a whole bunch of others that are turned on. If you have atrazine plus nitrate, which tend to can cancel each other a bit, you get this singular signal here, and if you have nitrate in present, you're changing these particular blue markers here. So it's possible to and we think to uh, identify biochemically the kinds of stressors that animals have been exposed to. Uh, this technology, there's a lot more coming. Uh, there's another, other papers in review now. But in this particular case, we're looking at key lipid, amino acid, and energy cycle pathways that have been altered. A whole suite of things that are never part of the EPA registration process. So, in summary, how do you control population size? The ecology of ecotoxicology. We can decrease births or we can increase deaths. And I've shown you how we can change fertility, reduce mating success, increase birth defects, which is the greatest source of infant mortality, and cha change fetal gene expression. By increasing deaths, we can enhance aggression, which is that triangle thing, contaminate the air, food, and water, compromised neurological, hormone, immune, and epigenetic functions, none of which are tested by the EPA, and alter the metabolome, the biochemical pathways of the body. So in summary, what have we learned? Data suggests that we may be sexually assaulting our children in utero, possibly altering their sexual preferences or aborting them prematurely. Virtually no marketed pesticide formulation has ever been registered by the EPA. So there are no data on formulations. Registrations do not include tests for neurological, endocrine, immune, developmental, or epigenetic DNA methylation tests. So there are no data from collectively sensitive tests. 
Finally, the data for registrations come from the companies that make the chemicals, a clear conflict of interest. So we have biased data. These are the bases for registration by the EPA. So the questions are, can we afford to raise generations of children that are neurologically, endocrinologically, immunologically, and reproductively impaired? Can we afford to induce chronic, long-term, subtle diseases and alter genetic expression that may be passed to subsequent generations? So in summary, here are three of the things that I showed you. The current status of three key human systems, neurological, endocrine, and immune functions, all of them being changed in very dramatic ways. We have a, a good, solid theoretical basis, but our EPA will not bar any of these chemicals. So we have one solution. We can allow illnesses to continue to accumulate until a breaking point is reached where the remaining population recognizes likely causes and decides to act. Or we can have change in market share. All you have to do is spend differently. We need unbiased research. We need PGMO labeling. We need an independent National Organic Standards Board and certifiers. Lately, the USDA has undermined this board and has inserted their own people, contrary to the laws of that thing. And finally, strong marketing campaigns. So in view of all that we've seen before, uh, uh, people often ask me, Warren, don't you think uh, we have a problem here? And don't you think things are going too slowly? And I say, well, you know, every time somebody asks me that question, I respond by saying I am always reminded of this story about this co-pilot, uh, co-pilot of Howard Harrison. He was a very famous war ace in Vietnam, and when the war was over there, he began to fly 747s. And he had a perfect landing pattern, perfect safety record. And one year, he just said to his boss, he said, I'm tired of taking these exams every year. I'm, I'm not going to bother to take them anymore. I've got this perfect record. And the boss said, Howard, he said, you better take that exam or we're going to ground you. He said, all right, all right, I'll take your exam. So he goes in and he flies through all the exams, no problem, until the very last exam, which is the eye exam, and he can hardly read the E on the top of the chart. And the doctor said, Howard, he said, how can you do that? You've got perfect landing patterns, perfect safety record, and you can hardly read the E on the top of my chart. Howard says, Doc, he says, I've been flying since I was 14. It's easy. You just get in the cockpit, you get taxi clearance, you taxi down to the end of the runway. You get takeoff clearance, you shove the stick forward, and off you go. Then I get up in the air, and I dial the autopilot. plane flies itself. And I get near the airport, and I get on the glide path, and I shove the stick forward, and down, down, down we go. And Doc said, I know, I know, Howard, but why don't you crash? He said, Doc, it's easy. You just keep going down and down and down. And when the co-pilot says, Jesus Christ, man, I pull back. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I just thought I'd tell you what I do to protect myself and my family. Clean, organic, or biodynamic diet as much as possible. Because one of the things we've learned is that the body chemistry responds very rapidly to good or bad diets. Pure filtered water for cooking and drinking. Reverse osmosis is thorough, but activated charcoal is also good. Drink plenty of fluids. That allows you to excrete water-soluble toxins in your urine. Sweat regularly. You excrete fat-soluble toxins when you sweat. Only one daily children's vitamin, which is little bits of stuff, not a big, massive vitamin dose. Omega L, uh, alpha omega-3, algae omega-3, not fish oil omega-3, because fish have got a lot of con uh, other stuff in it, and they can't get it out cleanly. And then CLA, conjugated linoleic acid, which, <clears throat> and then what's in parentheses there is what each of those are doing, replacing chelated ions, supporting neurological health, and an, a CLA is an immune stimulant. Amazing chemical, rheumatism especially. 
Join and support local, national, and international groups working for good causes like what you all represent right here tonight. We need to support organic farmers, get clean water and air, and justice issues, and we are a lot more effective at working together. So, thank you.